just had the signal to start. And um, I'm welcoming everyone to the Historical Dance Society online lecture series. I'm Talitha McKenzie, Talitha or Talita, either way is fine. Um, my longtime passion has been for French Impressionist music. And when I first was introduced to dance, and Baroque dance in particular, I was absolutely overjoyed um, because this brought together my love of the music of Maurice Ravel um, with my love for dance. So um, without too much ado, I'm going to share my screen so that you can see the slides that I've put together. Now, can everyone see, it should say Baroque Ballets of Maurice Ravel, is that correct? Excellent, good. I have no faith at all in PowerPoint, so um, I've had disastrous experiences with it. I try to avoid it whenever possible, but needs must. Um, well, okay. The first thing I'd like to ask is, can anyone recognize the people in the photograph? You know that this is Maurice Ravel. Can you see my cursor? Just thumbs up if you can. Can you see where I'm pointing? Yes, okay. So this is Maurice Ravel, and he is in his home just outside of Paris, um, where he moved after the war. It was um, uh, Le Belvedere is what it was called, Montfort uh, saint anne And um, he is with well-known dancer. Do, does anybody recognize this famous person? This is Vaslav Nijinsky. And they are playing through the score for, Ravel's score for Daphne et Chloé. More of that later. So this is Nijinsky and this is his sister Nijinska, Branislava Nijinska. How did I get interested in Ravel? Well, a couple of things. Um, I started out as a pianist when I was four. Well, I started out as a dancer when I was a th three, but I had to uh, choose between dance lessons and piano lessons, and there was a piano in the house. So there was no, um, uh, no real um, uh, reason why I shouldn't just go for the thing that was sitting in front of me. I couldn't, I couldn't bear not to play it. So I had a few uh, piano teachers uh, from the age of four to the age of 12. When I was 12, I started taking lessons with Avraham Sternklar or Sternklar. And uh, this is a picture of Avraham as a student. And uh, this is more or less as he is today. This is his pedagogical tree. He was a student of Kestenberg, who was a student of Kulak, who was a student of his father Kulak, who was a student of Czerny, and anybody who has studied piano will probably recognize the, um, the horrible studies, the finger studies that we used to have to play by Czerny, who was a student of Beethoven, who was a student of Haydn, and that brings us back to the Baroque period, more or less. Um, it was when I was studying with Abraham Sternklar that I, um, well, I was already in love with uh, the music of Debussy. So I had an ear for French Impressionist music, but um, I hadn't quite um, uh, fully introduced myself to the music of Ravel. But 1969, a terrible thing happened. Um, music, popular music went in a very bad direction. Um, I don't know um, if you were listening to the popular radio back in 1969, but the number one hit of the year was Sugar Sugar by the Archies. And that inspired me to turn the radio off. I thought, no, I can't abide this. It's, it just doesn't make any sense to me. But um, my sister said, oh, there's a lovely station that plays classical music, WNCN. And one of the programs that I listened to every night, pretty much, was New York Tonight. And they played 
recorded music of whatever was on at Carnegie Hall and, um, and other um, uh, performance spaces in New York City. So if you weren't able to get out and get a ticket, you could listen to the music um, already pre-recorded. They had fantastic theme tunes. And what I didn't know at the time was that they, it was two different movements from Ravel's Le Tombeau du Gouperin. Now, tombeau means, um, doesn't mean tomb exactly. It means like a, an homage to someone. And this is Ravel's homage to the composer Couperin, the Baroque composer. And the two movements that they used were the Rigodon and the Forlan. And I'm just going to play Uh, I'll play the Rigodon first because that's how it, that's how the program was opened. And then in the interval, they played um, the Forlan. I was absolutely mesmerized by this. I thought it was the most beautiful thing ever. And I went to Abraham and I said, what is this music? And I hummed it to him and he said, oh, I know what that is. And I went and I bought the um, sheet music for it and I started to learn. So how did I get intro introduced to Baroque dance? Well, I went to the um, dance festival, the American dance festival, and um, I just lucked out because they had introduced a course in social dance through the ages. The um, 16th century dance teacher was Ingrid Brainerd and we had a few weeks with her and then we had a few weeks with Wendy Hilton who was a Baroque dance teacher and then we had things like the Charleston and the Lindy Hop with Daniel Negrin so um, I was absolutely smitten and when I um, started to do the minuet with Wendy I thought oh right and this is the minuet as I had been playing um, in Ravel, and I'll just play a little bit of that. There are several minuets that he's composed. This is the one from the Topo de Cucaran. And then after, um, I was uh, 17 when I went to the American Dance Festival. I went from there to college at uh, Connecticut College, where the dance festival took place. And then I went to uh, the New England Conservatory, where I got my degree in ethnomusicology. The whole while I was at the New England Conservatory, I was studying with Julia Sutton. She was one of my primary tutors in music history, but she also led the Collegium Terpsichore. One of the things about Julia Sutton, she was a keyboard player as well. And she absolutely insisted that all the dancers had to learn the music, even if it was just to hum the music. And all the musicians had to learn the dancing. And she said to the musicians before any performance, do a few steps before you begin to play. And that was um, what kept everybody right. And it was the most holistic um, uh, strategy or uh, modus operandi that I had come across uh, in relation to music and dance. And I took that on board and that's what I use with my own students. All my students do both the music and the dance. Then in 2011, I had a workshop with Caroline Copeland. Caroline or Caroline, I'm not sure how she pronounces her name. And um, Lo and behold, she did a rigodon step. I had no idea rigodon was a dance. I mean, the music sounded really dancey, but I didn't realize what a rigodon was. 
And thanks to Carolyn, I was, um, I had left um, historical dance for a wee while. I had delved into um, Celtic music and, and Scottish folk dance. And um, it was uh, this Boston Early Music Festival. I was there at the Klarsach Festival. I was playing, I was performing with um, Anne Heyman, who was um, uh, famous for resuscitating the original Celtic Klarsach. And um, I went along to the dance workshop and I had a bit of an epiphany and thought, right, no, I have to go back to historical dance. I, I have to broaden my dance to not just Celtic, but just um, go back to European dance in general. So by this time, I was already teaching at the conservatoire and I had asked them, could I put together a course in historical dance? And um, they said, yes. And I said, what I would like to do is bring uh, professional dance teachers to the conservatoire. And I would be kind of a, a Diaghilev. I would um, organize everything. And they said, no, that's too expensive. If you want to have, if you want to run an historical dance course, you need to teach everything yourself. So I said, in that case, would you give me some staff development money? And they agreed to that. So I, the first thing I did was I went to have um, a workshop with Nicola Gaines Armitage, um, another workshop on the minuet. But this one was in particular um, uh, geared toward musicians. So um, she had a really, really interesting way to describe exactly how the hemiola is embedded in the steps of the, um, of the minuet. So as it came about, it replaced the courant, which is well known for its use of hemiola. You have um, either one, two, three, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, five, six. You have the rhythm going back and forth between the two. And um, the same thing, occurs in the minuet, but it's a little bit more subtle. And uh, she went through a clapping exercise where half the people were clapping um, one, two, three, four, five, six, and the other half were clapping one, two, three, four, five, six. And then she said, when is everyone clapping together? And everyone's clapping to together on the downbeat. Well, every second musical bar. And where is there nobody clapping? And nobody's clapping on number two and number six. And that's where you do your plie. And so it became very clear as to why exactly the minuet step is the way it is. Um, I also want to um, say that she has this um, DVD, Baroque Dance DVD, and it has not only dances, but also interviews. And it is a brilliant piece of, um, uh, well, it's, it's more than explanatory. It's just beautifully crafted um, by Nicola's uh, husband, John Armitage. And I strongly suggest that you have a look at this because it's um, well worth a watch. So I got more money from the Athenaeum Award, and I was able to study with Karim Modi. And also I went down to Chalamet with Barbara Siegel. So I had um, several different dance teachers and I was able to compare styles. Um, Karen Modig, who uh, runs the Nordic Baroque Dance Group, and she also um, runs the Dance Academy, which unfortunately is not happening this summer, but next year. So Carrie Modi, I shared with her my desire that, and the, the germ of this desire was um, when I had the workshop with Caroline Copeland um, and I found the Rigodon and I tried the Rigodon step with the Ravel music and I thought, what if we could have a choreography of Le Tombeau de Goubarin 
completely using Baroque dance movements. And I went to Karin and I said, would you um, be interested in helping me? Could you either choreograph this or help me to choreograph it? And she listened to the music and she said, I don't think this is the right way to proceed. The music is beautiful, but it's taking um, Baroque sensibilities and blending them with 20th century music style. She said, if you choreograph Le Tombeau, not as a Baroque suite, but with a blend of Baroque and early 20th century movement, you will do in dance what Ravel did in music. So because she felt that this 20th century element was crucial, was critical to the project, her challenge to me was to find a choreographer who specializes in dance of this period. Then I will agree to be a collaborator. So, at an amazing coincidence, um, I happened to be at the early dance lecture in 2018 when Millicent Hodgson and Kenneth Archer were giving a lecture on the continual triumph of Apollo, Nijinsky, Saraband, and the Ballet Russe Baroque. And Millicent and Kenneth were looking at Nijinsky's sketches of Baroque dance, uh, a Baroque dance choreography for a Bach suite. And uh, so she was looking for people who were interested in Baroque dance. And uh, she was also interested in this blend of 20th century and, um, and uh, 17th century, 18th, early 18th century. So I spoke to her afterward. I spoke to them both and I said, I'm doing this project on the Tombeau du Couperin, would you like to be involved? Um, and she said, um, we are completely solidly booked. It would be totally impossible. But yes, I can't say no, because this sounds like a fantastic project. So we made a deal that I would go back to Karin and I would ask her if she agreed to have a collaboration, um, the four of us. And she said, you know, that's such a coincidence because I had just contacted Millicent and Kenneth because um, I'm interested in this Bach Saraband. And um, uh, so they were already speaking to one another, but they'd never met. In the meantime, I was uh, doing my research myself on Ravel. I thought I knew everything there was to know about Ravel, but um, I found that there was an enormous, um, I'm just going to see if I can do this, take you out of screen share for a moment and show you this book. This is the book of letters of Maurice Ravel. And I'm still working my way through. I'm about three quarters of the way through. And I had been reading online about um, Ravel's letters and wondering whether I was going to need to go to France, brush, it up, brush up on my French and go to France and find them and translate them. But no, all of that work was done for me. Um, so this book of letters and articles, he's actually written a very powerful article on why Nijinsky should be thought of as a wonderful dancer and um, a great choreography uh, choreographer and not somebody who is um, just uh, not to be listened to or too avant-garde. And then Ravel, Man and Musician is um, Orenstein's uh, biography of Ravel. So who is Maurice Ravel? Uh, well, he was born on the 7th of March, 1875 in Cibor, or Cibourg, um, that's near Saint-Jean-de-Luz, where he returned uh, whenever he was feeling he needed um, a pick-me-up, he would go back to Saint-Jean-de-Luz. It is in the French Basque country, and his mother was born in the Basque country, we believe, um, but she lived in Spain, and so a lot of Ravel's dance music is Spanish dance music, um, in addition to the historical dance music. Ravel's father was from Switzerland, and um, I find this really interesting. Um, my piano teacher, Ravel, piano teacher, um, Avraham, 
said to me once, the difference between Debussy and Ravel is that um, if you imagine a pool of water on a warm summer's evening and the mist is rising from it, the mist is Debussy. It's um, sort of uh, ethereal and the pool itself is Ravel because it has, um, it has a foundation, it has sides all around it that are holding it in um, a certain um, uh, in, a, in a certain um, structure. So Ravel's father from Switzerland, then Ravel grew up in, in France. He um, studied with Gabriel Faure. He was one of Faure's prize students. Um, he had close friendships with men and women, but he never married. He lived with his mother for many, many years. Um, was devoted to his mother and also to his Siamese cats. Ravel died in 1937, probably of neurasthenia, and um, the tragedy is, although he did leave behind him a body of work, he was filled with music up to his dying day and was not able to actually get it out. Um, he wasn't able to write out some of the com compositions that he had in his mind. Um, in his later years. So the dance music. Um, I said that he was interested in historical dance and wrote a lot of dance music. Um, the Mon Way Antique was his first composition, 1895. Um, I think that was his first published composition. Um, then he wrote a couple of pavans, the first of which was Pavan pour une enfant défude. And uh, he used to say that he chose to give it that title because he liked the way the words sounded and nothing more than that. And um, in his sonatine, he had um, another monwe as uh, the middle movement. Ma Mère Roi was his first full ballet. And he wrote this initially as a two piano piece. Pavane de la Belle au Bois Dormant is one of the most obvious um, dances. Um, I thought that the pavan would have been based on a 16th century pavan, um, but then when I saw the costumes for the ballet, they're all 18th century, so I'm thinking that it might be more of an 18th century pavan. Um, Monwe sur le nom d'Idan and Vos Noble Sentimental. Later, he um, they said that he abandoned the minuet and took the waltz as his favorite dance. Um, that didn't stop him composing a passacay. And the three dance movements of Le Tombeau du Couperin are the Forlan, the Rigadon, and the Monwe. This, he began the composition of this in 1914, before the war, and then he went away to war. He was an ambulance driver or a munitions driver. He was a driver and he sometimes drove munitions trucks and sometimes um, ambulances. Um, and it was the war that really affected uh, how he was thinking about this masterpiece composition. And um, the last dance, um, historical dance, was La Valse. Um, that was to be set in 1855 in Vienna. It was initially called Vienne. So of these, the ballets. Um, Jeanne Hugard was the choreographer of Ma Mère Roi, the Mother Goose, and um, that was dedicated to um, uh, sorry, no, that was choreographed by Jeanne Hugard in 1912. Um, Daphne et Chloé uh, was choreographed by Michel Fauquin in 1912 to 1914. Adelaide was the name of the ballet that used the music Danse Noble Sentimentale. That was choreographed by Ivan Christine. Le Tombeau de Couperin, and we'll talk more of that later, that had several choreographers. Bolero, which was originally called Fandango, uh, was choreographed by Bronislava Nijinska in 1928. And it was uh, requested by Ida Rubinstein. La Valse also, um, by that pair, um, Ida Rubinstein's troupe and Bronislava Nijinska choreography. Then there was an interesting uh, piece, Levantal de Jeanne, 
um, choreographed by Alice Bourga and Yvonne Frank. Um, this was a suite in which each movement was um, choreographed, sorry, composed by a different composer. So it's a bit of a potpourri and um, the, the feathers of the fan that make up the fan, each feather was a different composer. This is a picture of uh, the ballet, Ma Mère Noire. And um, you see the two, the, these are the, um, the We Dance students. I imagine they are probably in blackface. Ravel absolutely loved African-American music. And he would sometimes ask people if they could include something um, Afro-American so that he could um, make his music more bluesy in order to um, uh, justify that. This is the set for Daphne et Chloé by Leon Baxt. He is the same um, artist who did the set design and costumes for um, Le Sac du Printemps. Here's a picture of Ida Rubinstein. She originally had asked um, Ravel to, to um, transcribe some of Isaac Albanus's Iberia Suite for her dance company, but um, it turned out that someone else had already got the, um, the rights to do that. So he said, well, I'll just whip you up something instead, something, you know, just off the peg and he wrote Bolero. He was very proud of that uh, piece of music. There is a, um, uh, uh, some uh, buzz going around that because he wrote it when he was um, already suffering from brain disease that he lost his imagination. So that's why he repeated the same phrase over and over and over again. And that's not it at all. Um, he gave himself a very strict remit when he wrote it. He wanted to achieve something that, as far as he knew, no other composer had ever done. And that is without any change in dynamics or tempo, that he would start a piece, run it for 15 minutes, and by layering up the instruments, um, that he would have it appear to be uh, reaching a crescendo, just by adding extra instruments. and he did an amazing job and um, he said that it was one of his uh, favorite pieces. She also prompted him to compose La Vasse, so a very important person in his life. So focusing on Le Tombeau du Guberin, which is my favorite piano piece of all time, when I first came to uh, the idea that I wanted to do a project on this, I had several questions, I had to make some decisions. And my decisions, I have to say, changed as I was doing my research because I found out all sorts of things that took me on a different turning. So I had information that Ravel had taken a piece of Couperin music and transcribed it as an, um, an essay while he was at the Paris Conservatoire but I didn't know which piece of music. I found out it was a Forlan, but I didn't know which Forlan. And um, so I started buying up recordings and um, music for all of Couperin's dance suites. And I went through and went through and I, I couldn't figure out which one. But then in a footnote, in an article online, I mean, I had searched online several times and then suddenly this appeared and this is the music that Ravel had transcribed. So that's Jordi Saval and his, his band. Um, so then I wanted to show a connection between the 17th century Baroque dance and the music of Ravel. With this in mind, um, that Karin had suggested that I not use Baroque dance 
for the actual Tabu de Couperin music. Then I thought, okay, well, I can take a work by Couperin and, well, my first part of call was to find out whether there was anything choreographed already by Couperin. But it turns out that no, there wasn't. So I asked Kari <clears throat> if she would be willing to choreograph a suite by Couperin, and she said yes. So now it's just a question of finding the funding to pay for the choreography. Then, um, was Couperin's dance music choreographed? No, the answer to that is no. <clears throat> then there are six movements to Le Tombeau de Couperin. Three of them are Monwe, Rigodon, and Forlan. But there are three other movements, a prelude, a fugue, and a toccata. These are not dances. So I had to decide if I'm going to do a choreography, should I include those or not? It turns out that in the actual um, ballet, when it was first done, they only did the dance movements. They only choreographed the dance movements. So that's a possibility. So this is just, um, I thought this would be amusing to add. Ravel said in a letter in um, 1914, I am transcribing a Forlan by Couperin. This is after he'd done it as a student. He was transcribing it for orchestra. I will see about getting it danced at the Vatican by Miss Tanguet and, oops, and Colette Willie in drag. Now Colette, you might know, is um, the author of Gigi. Uh, she was a French uh, writer, a um, good friend of Ravel, and she uh, collaborated collaborated with Ravel on his um, L'Enfant et les Sortilèges, his opera. And she used to wear men's clothing. So uh, this, was, this was a nod and a wink to the fact that the Vatican, the Pope in the Vatican, thought that the Forlan was a better dance, um, was a proper dance to do, and that people should be doing that rather than some of the more lascivious dances um, in, uh, back in the day. Uh, so he was thinking that if the Pope were to see Colette in drag dancing to his Forlan, he might have a different opinion. So who is Couperin? Couperin, 1668 to 1733, um, quite a prominent composer. I think he's overshadowed by Lully and Bach and other composers at around the same time. Um, but he wrote a lot of dance music. And this is when I found out that the Forlan that um, Ravel had transcribed was from the Concert Royaux, the Quatrième Concert. And it included a Rigodon and a Forlan. There was no Monwe in that Concert, but in the first Concert, there was a Monwe. And I will just play a little bit of the Brigadon. If I can find it. <laughs> And the one way I think we've played a little bit of that already. So just a quick word about dance types, but I just wanted to show you that you have really a continuum with noble dance types and grotesque dance types at two different ends of the spectrum. Um, the noble dance types are generally in triple time. Triple time was considered to be divine. Um, the Trinity is, uh, is a triple entity. So um, you see that the Saraban, Lourdes, Courant, Pasakai, Monwe, Chacon, um, all triple time uh, dances. Um, the pastoral will include some of the 
gentle dances that are also, they have a bit of rustic in them. They're um, pastoral, they're, they could be danced out of doors. Um, they're a little less noble than the noble dances, but not quite as rustic as the rustic dances. And the Forlan is in that category. The Forlan is in compound time. And so it's uh, either in 6-8 or 6-4, depending. And the rustic dances, peasant dances, include the rigodon. And the rigodon is in duple time. And you can see that um, most of these, as you get down to the bottom, most of the dances are in duple time, which is the time signature of mortal people, not divine people. And just a quick word about dance notation, because um, I always like to give credit to Pierre Beauchamp. A lot of people refer to this as feuillet notation, but Beauchamp, who was uh, Louis XIV's dance teacher, he um, was instrumental in creating this dance notation, but feuillet got it published, so of course his name stuck. So the forlan does not have a specific forlan step. You can um, use a variety of steps in forlan, but they are lilty, lifting steps, a bit bouncy, but not quite as rustic as uh, the rigodon. Um, here you have the pas de gaillard at the top. Actually, if you go from bottom to top, this is how the dance proceeds. You start with a contretemps de gavotte, and then a pas coupé, Si song, which is jumpy in, in place, and um, pas de bure en boite, and then the pas de gaillard here. This is the rigodon step. And um, if you have any experience reading the notation, you can see that uh, for start, it's, it's in place. There's no um, moving forward in this. The movement is side to side and up and down, um, but pretty much in place. And uh, in this instance, you're starting with your left. You put your left out to the side as you hop on your right, and then you put your right out to the side and then bring the feet together. And then in the next bar, you jump together in first position. So it's uh, the timing is left, right, left, and jump. Monwe step, it's basically a demi coupé and a pas de bourré. Um, you could also say it's two demi coupés and two straight steps. Um, but the main thing is that it has two mouvements. And these uh, are the plié followed by the rise. And uh, the pliés are marked here. And this is where you have this plié on beat six of the previous bar and then beat two. So you have your two plies sandwiching the rise on the downbeat, which is the most prominent beat. That's where everyone was clapping together, if you remember Nicola's uh, um, illustration. And then of course you have the um, step, 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 your three steps uh, for the pas de bourre. And this is the Monway, a minuet in context. It would be done by one couple at a time. This is a, an illustration from Rameau. I'll have all of these um, sources indicated in the, um, in the slide at the end. So where did we begin? It turned out that the, um, at the Royal Conservatoire, the students were in the middle of a collaboration with the keyboard department, the ballet, modern ballet, and the keyboard students were getting ready to do Le Sac du Printemps. And I thought this is a perfect way of meeting Millicent um, for the second time and working with her to find out more about 20th century movement. And so um, she came in with uh, Kenneth and they did a workshop for the pianists, and this is our team, where um, Kari joined us uh, this for the second um, group of workshops. And so Kari was doing um, a Baroque dance, and Millicent and Kenneth were teaching the students 
scenes from Je, which is uh, to Debussy music. So getting the music from the French Impressionist era and um, the dance movement from the 20th century. And this was Nijinsky who choreographed this. Then I found out, okay, I didn't realize that Le Tombeau had actually been choreographed. Not only had it been choreographed, this was also discovered in a footnote, um, where Ravel had said to um, some friend of his in a letter, I am off to conduct um, the 100th performance of the ballet for Le Tombeau du Couperin. And in the footnotes, it said, uh, Ballet Suédois were the dancers who um, performed it in Paris. And this is Jean Bolin and Jenny Hasselquist, and they were the primary dancers. Now you can see straight away that the costumes are not exactly um, in the time period of Couperin, and also the handhold is not so Baroque. I don't know if you had actual Baroque costumes, whether you could lift your arm as high as that. Um, and the other thing about this ballet was that um, the pianist that they were rehearsing with played everything at such a slow tempo that the choreography wasn't suitable when they sped the music up, when they got to Paris and they played it for Ravel. Um, the choreo choreography didn't really work so well at the faster tempo. So um, it had to be adapted very quickly before they uh, put it on the stage. Le Tombeau du Couperin, um, I said it took a turn when uh, Ravel came back from the war. It was originally an homage to Couperin, but it turned out that he dedicated each um, movement of the suite to a different person, a friend of his, or uh, a child or relative of a friend of his um, who had fallen in the war. And this really affected how he thought about the music. He was in the middle of composing it um, when he went away. And when he came back, he was in a completely different frame of mind, as you can well imagine. This is the frontispiece for the uh, music, Le Tombeau de Couperin music, as it was published by Jacques Durand. And um, I didn't find this out until just recently that Ravel painted this. This is his artwork. The Forlan and the Rigodon were um, dedicated to the Basque painter Gabriel de Luc, and one of the, well, it's actually. And this is one of the twins, but um, the two twins, Pierre and Pascal Gaudin, who were childhood friends of his. Um, Gabriel was a long time friend of Ravel's. He also had a painting that he gave to Ravel, um, which looks very similar to the Daphne et Chloé. You can imagine Daphne et Chloé in the painting, very similar to the uh, boxed set. Um, the Monway was dedicated to um, a relative of Alexei Roland Monwell, who was a very close friend of, of Ravel's. Ravel wrote many letters to him. You can really get a, a feel for their relationship. And um, so in the answer to whether to um, choreograph the, the prelude, the fugue and the toccata, my idea for choreographing the prelude was to have the dancers take the role of Ravel Siamese cats and that the pianist would actually be on stage performing and the dancers would come into the space and dance in front of the pianist and that the, um, the dancers for the prelude would be dancing as as cats. And this is the music. And you can see them doing tumble salts all over the stage while Ravel is trying to compose.
So this is obviously a work in progress. Um, phase one is complete in so much as the, um, uh, the students have had workshops with Millicent Hudson and Kenneth Archer and Kai Modi. Um, the initial idea was that the conservatoire students would learn Baroque dance well enough that they could dance the Couperin suite, followed immediately by Le Tombeau du Couperin using the 20th century movements and choreographing it themselves. But um, with uh, the coronavirus and um, uh, miscommunications and uh, sundry other things. Um, it didn't work out this way. There was just not enough time to get all of that done. So the students did make their own choreography of the Tombu du Gubara. I'm not even sure that it was actually performed because it was the week just before lockdown that it was meant to be performed. Um, so I have decided that I'm going to um, make another attempt to get more funding. I have got a little bit more funding to go to Paris to do uh, research where Ravel lived in, there's a museum where his house used to be. Well, his house still stands and it, they turned it into a museum. And um, so I'm hoping that I will be able to bring this a little bit further forward and be involved in designing costumes and sets and make a professional um, version, professionally staged version of this, not just um, something at a student recital, but something that could be toured um, not only in um, Scotland, but also in Paris and in London and maybe even further afield. So um, this is just the beginning. I mean, well, I would imagine I'm about a quarter of the way through. Phase one is complete. I'm writing up the report. Um, I'll leave you with this. Uh, Ravel with Mooney. This is the, uh, the cat, Siamese cat Mooney. And uh, Julius Jacobson has quoted, apparently he went a bit overboard with the cats, allowing them to invade his work table, speaking to them in cat language, playing with them ceaselessly, and filling letters to his friends with their details. And that's from the classic, classical music experience. And so uh, using that as inspiration to get me going, um, I'm hoping to start work on uh, uh, what they call a, a, an argument. I've just discovered this. Uh, when you write a, a text for how a ballet should proceed, it's called an argument. So I'm going to be writing up the argument and see if I can get funding and see if I can progress this to a further stage. And it's time for questions, so I'd better, I'd better sign off. Um, uh, thank you to Talitha for a uh, fascinating um, uh, exploration of the work so far. And we will wait with bated breath to see how it uh, how it progresses this this is your opportunity we've got about five minutes of questions before we finish before eight um the way to ask the questions is to use the chat box uh type in the chat box make sure you press return at the end of your question uh and then i'll um i'll ask talisa to um uh, to answer for you so um I'm sure we'll ask some questions actually right Anne, well, Anne asks so can well, you see I'm, the can you see the chat? Please? I'm going to share the um, the illustration uh, so that you can. Okay, I'm get, we've, we've got five minutes to leave, so I'm going to try and pick these questions up for you. Um, so Anne Day is interesting. Interested in knowing what did Millicent and Kenneth base their movement ideas on? On notes from the scores, um, Stravinsky had a lot of notes in his Sac du Printemps score. Um, there were illustrations. That Nijinsky had. There were, they did quite a lot of research. They also, um, there were interviews with uh, Marie Rambert and um, uh, some other of the dancers who were in Le Sac du Printemps. In Je, I think there were more um, written documents. They were better able to um, put that together. But yes, they had a lot of, uh, I would say, I think they said it was about 70%. Um, and then maybe another 25 to 30% that they had to 
invent to um, uh, to fill in the gaps. Um, and Anne's um, added an extra bit saying that, that she was thinking, meaning uh, the tombeau. If that changes your answer. What was that? Uh, she was thinking of, she was meaning the tombeau. Tombeau de Cooperin. Um, well, tombeau could mean um, fall. But in this instance, it means homage. It's not, um, it's not a lament. It's something to celebrate the life of someone who has passed away. Um, he was, uh, Ravel actually expressed that you could write a tombeau for somebody who was still alive. Um, so you could write an homage to them without their having passed away. But by and large, most of the, um, um, most of the tumble are for people who have passed away. Okay. Uh, we had another question from Catherine this time, um, who asks, uh, who, who exactly is choreographing the contemporary tumble? Um, well, this hopefully will be a collaboration between Millicent and Karin Modi. Uh, Millicent will be taking the lead on that and um, Karin will be hopefully choreographing the Couperin. This is all pending funding. Um, yes, indeed. If the, if the funding doesn't come, I might just be um, ending up choreographing everything myself. So I have to be choreographer in training. I did a lot of choreography when I was in um, my teens, but I haven't really done very much since then. So where, do you have a time scale for when you think you might be bringing that out then? Well, the 100th um, performance of Tombeau with the Ballet Suédois was done, uh, was performed in 1923. Um, the first performance was November um, 1920. I think that's a little short notice to get it done before November this year, particularly mm. considering mm. Um, circumstances. <laughs> but um, 2023 is possible. Get your skates on. Yeah. Um, and and as asked, uh, in relation to the, the Suédois version, um, what, was there any available detail from that tombeau? There are very, very few photographs and there, as far as I understand, there are no notes. I've asked my friends at uh, the Dance Musée in Stockholm, um, there doesn't seem to be anything there. And uh, Millicent said they dug through everything um, and they didn't find anything. So there is a centennial uh, Ballet Suédois, um, it was meant to be in May, uh, but they're having it in September. And if I can manage to get to that, I'm hoping I'll I'll find, I'll be able to speak to somebody who is an expert in Ballet Suédois and I might even meet someone who has a connection to that particular performance, but that's information that still needs to be ascertained. Right, we've got time for one more question, if anyone else has another question. not. Um, I want on behalf of you all to thank uh, Talitha for a, a fascinating uh, talk this evening um, in the latest of our weekly Historical Dance Society lockdown lectures. Um, we'll be putting the, uh, the video of that out on our YouTube channel so make sure you go to there and catch up with this and you'll be able to see the other ones there as well. Um, I'll make sure that I include the link to it in the blog um, if that's available in time for tomorrow's. Otherwise, it'll come out next week. Um, back here next time, same time next week, when Hazel Dennison will be um, taking us through Making Dances to the Esther Court, 1400 to 1500. Book your space now. Thanks very much. Keep safe. Have a good week. Bye now. <laughs>